Good evening, welcome in folks. Um, my name is Neek, I'm the Education Programs Manager for Grand Staircase Escalante Partners. We're a nonprofit organization committed to support, supporting and promoting Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument um, and its scientific and cultural resources. Uh, we share monument science through educational programs, carry out restoration and monitoring projects, and advocate for land management policies that support the biodiversity of this region. Um, so welcome to this evening's Ask an Expert event. Um, we've started these events as a way to um, have folks connect with and learn from the many experts who have worked in the Grand Staircase Escalante region and have expanded our understanding of GSCNM landscapes and ecosystems. Um, so real quick, just a review of how to ask questions this evening. Um, you have a couple of, uh, oh yeah, you can use the chat function um, if you'd like to drop questions and comments. Um, uh, you also can use the Q&A box. So if you click on that little Q&A icon, opens a box that you can put questions in, um, and I will then pass those along to our presenter. Or you can ask a question verbally. Um, so if you click raise your hand, I'll get a notification, and I'll go ahead and unmute you to ask your question. Um, so, uh, tonight we have the opportunity to learn about GSCNM's paleo environments and what this study of past environment tells us about this region's history, how it's useful for us in the present and future. And we're going to be learning this from Krista Sadler, who is a paleontologist, geologist, wilderness and river guide, and the author of Where Dinosaurs Roam, Lost Worlds of Utah's Grand Staircase, uh, which is a very cool book. You should check it out. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Krista to provide a brief introduction um, to her work and to this whole paleo environment thing, and then we'll open it up to questions. All right. Thanks, Neek. Um, I appreciate it. And welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming and sitting down at this talk uh, tonight. Um, it's really fun to be doing this, although I'm still getting used to the whole virtual talk stuff. I like to see the people I'm talking to. Um, so yeah, I've, I was trained as a paleontologist and I actually worked as a paleontologist before in, in the Grand State area before it became a monument. So back in the late eighties. And back then we had no idea just what an extraordinary place it is for fossils of plants, animals, invertebrates, vertebrates, just all kinds of stuff. So um, it's been really fun to continue the work and get out there with some of the, the groups and find out what the new stuff is and um, and to write the book because I think I learned probably more than I uh, taught in that book. So anyway, uh, hopefully this will be, I'm just going to show you some really brief slides, uh, maybe 15 slides, just to sort of get some of the concepts out and then I'm happy to um, answer or try and answer uh, some of your questions. So thank you. So let's see, should I, I guess I should share my screen. screen yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's see, how's this working? Ah. Okay. Hopefully everyone can see this. Do you have a way of knowing, Neek, if this is working yes. for people? Yes, it's working. I can see okay. it. Great. They can see it. <laughs> Okay, so um, I couldn't come up with a really exciting title, so we're just going to stick with Ancient Environments um, of Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. It is uh, a really, I mean, I think that's exciting, so uh, hopefully you will too. But then also, as our friend uh, Lythronax down there at the bottom is saying, you know, can we learn about the future from the past? And there are some really interesting questions um, that we may be able to, certainly can ask and may be able to be, uh, begin to answer from this um, the stuff we've learned. Okay, now I have to make sure that this is, ah, there we go. Okay, just to remind you where we are, um, hopefully you can see my cursor there. Is that working, Neek? You see the little cross? Okay. Um, so the Colorado Plateau centering on the, the Colorado, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, the Four Corners, and then right in here, smack dab between uh, Glen Canyon National Recreation Area and Capitol Reef and a whole bunch of national parks and forests is Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. And I am going to talk about the, the original monument as it was established. Um, 
And here's just a little bit closer. So, you know, again, we're kind of going to the original monument because um, there are paleontological sites throughout this monument. Um, so I'm just gonna keep it as it was for now. Um, now, the, the monument is really famous for rocks of a certain age, but I wanted to, you know, just make it really clear that the layers in Grand Staircase kind of span from here, the late Permian, about say, let's say 252 you know, million years old, all the way up into the Paleocene right here, the top blue arrow. Um, but the stuff that we're really going to talk about, um, although there are fossils in every layer that you can find in the monument. Um, we're gonna talk about the stuff that's this top part of this pale green, the late Cretaceous. That is really what's been making news and what we're kind of learning the most about um, in recent years. And there are literally thousands of sites um, uh, in these late Cretaceous rocks. So. So when you look at these pictures, and you'll see these again, these are just some different views from the monument. It is really hard to imagine what this place used to look like, um, you know, 75, 80, 100 million years ago. So I'm going to try and give you just a quick sense of some of that. To start with, um, you need to understand that during the late Cretaceous, um, so starting about 100 million years ago on up to about 65 million years ago, um, or for Grand Staircase, we'll call it about 75 million years ago. The, our world looked completely different. And you can see here, um, our continent was divided into two subcontinents. So a long skinny one here called Laramidia, and then this big one here called Appalachia. And then uh, in the middle was the Western Interior Seaway, this shallow ocean that had kind of ex, um, you know, overflowed into the, the center of the continent. Um, Overall, the whole planet was a lot warmer. Um, sea level was much higher, as you can see here. Um, we had CO2 levels in the atmosphere that may have been close to today's levels. Uh, there were no permanent ice caps because of this, and there were conifers at the poles. And then southern Utah also lay at about 46 degrees latitude, and it's 46 degrees north latitude. It is a lot different than that now because things have moved around. Um, I also wanted to point out that there are outcrops of late Cretaceous rocks um, all over Utah, but um, some of them are different age. They're a little bit younger. They might be a little bit, um, you know, covering different parts of the late Cretaceous. But these are really the ones we're looking at right in here um, in what we now call the Kaparowitz Plateau, but used to be known as the Kaparowitz Basin. Um, again, if you want to deposit rocks, you can't do it on top of a plateau. It has to be in a... Uh, a low area. So this one's kind of fun. I'll give you a little chance to look at it. Um, if you look at, so up here, each one has a name and a general age. So the Naturita Dakota formation around 98 million years ago, the Tropic Shale, the Straight Cliffs formation, the Waweep formation, the Kaparowitz formation. These are the five formations that, um, and, and the Canyon Peak is a little bit also, the six formations that make up the late Cretaceous in the Grand Staircase region. And the reason I put these in here is to kind of show you, you can get a, a a little bit of a time lapse uh, effect of what's going on here with um, here you've got you know the ocean is starting to intrude into the into the uh, continent by 93 million years ago the there's a big wide open seaway by and then that seaway starts to get a little narrower as more stuff is deposited here whoops here here and then finally by uh, the time we get to the the boundary where the dinosaurs became extinct, uh, that seaway is almost completely dried up. And so all of these different um, environments left us different sediments and um, different sort of fingerprints that we can get a sense of what was going on. So some of these things that, that uh, paleontologists and other scientists have used to sort of get a sense of what I'm gonna show you. We've looked at the fossils. We've looked at oxygen and carbon isotopes, uh, the sediments, what kind of sediments do we have? Paleomagnetic data. We look at modern biology, botany and ecology. We look at anatomy of creatures, bone histology, chemical analysis, structural geology, radiometric dating, and a whole, there's actually a whole bunch of other stuff too. But these are all things that go into creating um, our understanding of an ancient environment. 
So real quick, I'll run through them. The Natcherita Formation, um, also known as the Dakota Formation on the eastern side of um, that ocean that you saw. Um, this is the, the Natcherita is this kind of middle, as you can see where my cross is, sort of this uh, above this white stuff and below the gray stuff. This is the Natcherita. And it represents a time of a rising sea level. And what we start to see is um, a lot of flowering plants really beginning to take over. Uh, things like modern or um, relatives, ancient relatives of the rose family, the magnolia family. So a lot of these things are, are more modern plants. We have conifers further away. Um, we we see things like early bee burrows. These are early, early, early duck-billed dinosaurs back there. Uh, we have horsetails and things like that growing around these muddy areas. Um, and some pretty primitive turtles here, um, things like that. And then, a, and then a, a relative of modern crocodiles here, a goniophilid uh, uh, crocodile here. So about 98 million years ago, this is what southern Utah would have looked like. Right along the coast, the coast is out there, and the water is beginning to encroach. Over time, it continues to encroach. By about 93 million years ago, the water has completely flooded, you know, where the Grand Staircase is, and left us the tropic formation, this really beautiful gray, what they call, um, you know, the moonscape out near uh, Big Water. And you can see it's a really wide ocean. And this ocean was just crazy with um, things with teeth. <laughs> lots and lots of stuff with teeth. We see um, uh, uh, these guys, these short-necked plesiosaurs, kind of relatives of the, the Loch Ness looking plesiosaurs. Um, big, big carnivorous fish here. Um, we have lots and lots of sharks. These early, early mosasaurs, these marine lizards that a little bit later in time would become these massive giants. Um, early marine turtles here. And then you also have things like uh, ammonites and oysters and snails and stuff like this. So um, a lot of predators in this ocean. So obviously there were a lot of things to eat. Um, but still, and it was a pretty diverse ocean, but not nearly as diverse as some of today's oceans. Um, less oxygen in the water, stuff like that. By the time we get up to the Wawip, which is about 80, 81 million years ago, the ocean is now starting to retreat again. This is the Wawip formation here. And um, you can see there's a little less less ocean, a lot more land. And it's kind of this soggy, um, swampy, boggy, you know, still near coastal, but a lot more land now. And we're starting to see um, some amazing diversity. This is the most diverse terrestrial fauna. So fauna from up on land um, from this time period in all of North America. Um, so we have uh, interesting, you know, all kinds of, we have conifers in the back again. We have all kinds of interesting uh, flowering plants. We start seeing early hadrosaurs like this guy, Acris davis. Um, this little weird Struthiomimus is like an ostrich-like uh, two-legged dinosaur. This is a little carnivore here, massive um, uh, Dinosuchus, this big, big crocodile or alligator here. Um, and then, you know, lots of other really interesting things. We also um, have uh, the early, early sort of Tyrannosaurid uh, that we call Lythronax, the one that I showed the little picture of in the very first slide. We start seeing these shifts in the ecosystem from lots and lots and lots of big predators that we used to see, say, back in the Jurassic, to just one big predator and lots of small predators like, like these guys here. So things are sort of starting to shift and get a lot more um, complex. And then by about 74 to 76 million years ago, the Kaparowitz Formation is the most amazing formation pretty much in the region. Um, incredibly diverse. It is 2,800 feet thick and deposited over only 2 million years, which is an extraordinary thing. This is uh, kind of near where the Blues is. It's actually out near Horse Mountain, but same idea. And you have a little more land, a little less water, but we're still near the coast. But what now what we have is this massive river system, maybe it's something on the scale of the Ganges that's coming out of these mountains here 
and flowing out towards the ocean and braiding back and forth across the land. So you have all these different environments where all these amazing creatures can live. You had, um, you know, crocodiles here and um, marsupials up here. You have these crazy looking duckbill dinosaurs, Parasauralophus. This is a little tyrannosaur called Teratophonius. He's actually really big, but this is a young one. Um, and three different kinds of horn dinosaurs. This is just one of them called Cosmoceratops with these cool like bangs, uh, horns that act, look like bangs. Um, co again, conifers sort of related to redwoods in the, in the uplands or the away from the water and then lots and lots of water plants and these smothering vines all over these trees, cypress trees and things like that. Now, a lot of people have um, suggested that this landscape was a lot more like um, the southern Louisiana today or parts of Southeast Asia today. So much warmer, much more humid, much less seasonal than we have today. Um, so the cool thing, one of the questions that you know geologists have been asking, paleontologists, so what is the importance of the, the, importance of the Kaparowitz formation and, and the general fossils that we're finding um, in the late Cretaceous in, in Grand Staircase? And I just wanted to show you this. So this is Grand Staircase, the red star. And all of these little boxes are different late Cretaceous sites in the Western uh, part of our country. Uh, a couple in Montana, up in Canada, uh, down in Big Bend, and this is Northwestern New Mexico. They're not all exactly the same age, some are, but what this red star has been able to do is completely fill in our knowledge of late Cretaceous ecosystems, terrestrial ecosystems um, in Western North America. And it has really started, it's, it's actually become a world-class site for understanding how terrestrial ecosystems have evolved um, and what they looked like back then. So these might be a little too small for you guys to read or maybe not, but um, there are some really important aspects to the late Cretaceous fossil record. One is that we can see the beginnings of several lineages of dinosaurs, lizards, turtles, mammals. You know, this is the beginning of our modern world, um, what we think of as modern. Um, there is so much preserved in the fossil record of the Kaparowitz that we literally can begin to reconstruct an entire ecosystem, which is extraordinary in the fossil record. Because when you think about it, the things that fossilize well are the things with hard parts. But we've got ant nests and beetle scrapings and just all kinds of crazy things. So we can actually start to reconstruct an entire paleo ecosystem, which gives us a much better idea of what was going on back then. There's also an extraordinary amount of diversity in this ecosystem. Um, a lot more than you get to the north in Canada or Montana, and apparently a lot more than you get to the south. It is an extremely biodiverse ecosystem. So there was something about this place, 40, you know, 46 degrees latitude. Um, it was the Goldilocks, you know, not too hot, not too cold, just perfect. There's also a really high level of what we call provincialism or endemic species in the ecosystem, which is a really interesting question. Because why? Why didn't things just move all over the place? Because they could, but they didn't. And um, so these are some questions that are, are really interesting or parts about the, the late Cretaceous record that are really interesting. And these are some questions that I think um, a lot of paleontologists are using to uh, look at the future as well as the past. So why is there such a high level of this provincialism, this endemic species only found in the Kaparowitz Basin, not anywhere else? Why didn't they go anywhere else? Um, here's a really interesting question that paleontologists are trying to answer is what is life like in a hothouse climate with higher CO2? And this is a really interesting question because you know, a lot of people think we are heading for sort of the late Cretaceous style of, of climate. Um, so where will the greatest biodiversity be in a warmer climate? Does it looks from the late Cretaceous lake, you have less diversity to the south, whereas today we have more diversity, um, higher biodiversity in the tropics, things like that. But that doesn't seem to be the case in a warmer climate. How do these ecosystems function and, and respond to this warmer climate? This is something that's really um, an interesting question that people are trying to answer. And then also, does evolution work differently in this hothouse world that, uh, of the late Cretaceous? And can we 
sort of translate that to the future. Um, this can have implications for everything from agricultural production to management of parks and public lands and all kinds of stuff like that. So it's not that we have the answers right now, but for the first time using the Kaparowitz formation, especially, we're able to actually try and we can actually ask these questions with the hope of trying to get some answers and, and see if there's an implication for our future um, in, in, this, uh, in this past. And so, you know, I'd like to just end by saying that, that all of the fossils that are being found in Grand Staircase are really important. And um, it doesn't matter if we've already found a bunch of things, it's always important to find more. We've only explored probably less than 10% of the monument in terms of how many fossils, um, you know, fossil sites we found. And yet we still have one of the best records in the world and there's only more to learn. Um, so what I would say is uh, places like this, you know, the Grand Staircase, other public lands are really important scientific repositories of, of this information that can help us not just understand our past, but also possibly our future. And just wanted to remind everybody to exercise your democratic right to vote if you have not already. Um, that's what actually Lythrin X would like to remind you. Um, so that was a really quick look at the later stages of <laughs> Grand Staircase, but um, thank you so much. And if you have some questions, I would be really happy to try and answer them. Great, thanks so much for that um, introduction. Um, always excited to nerd out about paleo environment. Um, the first question for you is um, this amazing Kaparowitz formation here. Why or why or like what are the hypotheses if it's not known for sure? Um, why was there such a high rate of sediment deposition during that period? Um, well, you had a uh... So you had a basin that was subsiding or sinking down. So it's, it's going lower and able to receive more sediment. And it was sinking fast enough that all of that sediment that was coming off the mountains to the west with you know, those big rivers, the, the big sort of Ganges style river system, just kept dumping stuff into this basin. And because the basin kept uh, subsiding, it could keep uh, receiving more and more. So it's a really unusual, uh, I mean, that's how these things occur, but this is an unusually fast uh, amount of deposition for such a huge pile of sediment. So, mm -hmm. and things, what it also means is that things got buried quickly um, so right. they could become fossils really, really easily, which is another reason we have such an incredible, um, you know, representation okay. of the ecosystem. And Earlier, you mentioned this whole Kaparowitz Basin versus Kaparowitz Plateau. Uh, is it called the plateau because everything else has eroded around it now? Yeah. Or, okay. Yeah. So um, it was a basin, but now. It, yeah, it was a basin. Now it's a plateau. And all of the stuff that, that happened to, you know, lift up the whole Colorado Plateau and then the little plateaus within the Colorado Plateau, that all happened much, much, much later than all of this. That happened within the last you know, a few tens of millions of years as opposed to um, 90 million years ago. Oh, yeah. So basically just yesterday. Um, well, geologically, yeah. Go to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Ken says, we drove over the Kaparowitz just a few weeks ago, not knowing what we were seeing. Are there any plans for some interpretive services for that area? Ah. Uh, well, it would depend where it is that you were driving. Um, I don't know if it was like Smoky Mountain or some of those areas. I, I know that over Smoky, the, Mountain. Um, Smoky Mountain, that's such an awesome road. Um, <laughs> uh, the, what I have heard is that there are plans for a uh, potentially a museum in Escalante, which um, tells you I'm not actually from the area because I should be calling it Escalante. Um, but uh, I think that they're talking about putting in a museum that would have a lot of the fossils from Grand Staircase. And it's probably, you know, years away yet, but they have talked about it. The other thing I would recommend is just to go to the visitor centers. Um, the visitor center in Kanab is really good, shows a lot of the geology. The visitor center in uh, Escalani has a lot of uh, great 
you know, information. And then also at Big Water, um, there's really nice dinosaur exhibits and other fossil exhibits there. Um, I have not heard about anything like a plan for an interpretive, you know, signs across the monument or anything like that. Um, but might not be a bad idea. <laughs> Let people know what they're seeing. Sure, great. Um, so can you, one of the questions that you presented at the end of your um, little presentation there um, was about sort of this question of does evolution work differently in a hot house world? So could you share more about that? Um, like what are some of the hypotheses about how evolution might function differently? Um, what are the implications of that? Well, yeah, that's a good question. And I'm not sure that people know for sure, but um, there is some suggest, some people have suggested that perhaps things don't evolve as fast in um, a climate that is sort of more uh, even and doesn't have like this seasonality or extreme cold, cold areas or, or uh, warm areas. Um, and again, that sort of has implications for things like agricultural, uh, could have implications for agricultural practices or stuff like that. Um, that's, you know, sort of most of what, what I've heard is that people question, does, do, do things sort of stay in more of a stasis? Um, which could have implications for if something is in stasis or not, let's say, not capable of changing as fast, uh, what happens if, say, a disease comes in or, you know, some other kind of natural um, or human caused or human exacerbated issue, do those creatures then not have the capability of standing up to that sort of genetically and biologically? Um, mm -hmm. It also, the whole question of is is there going to be greater biodiversity in these middle latitudes as opposed to say the tropics do we start seeing dead zones in the tropics when things get too hot everything moves up more to the middle latitudes how does that affect everything from ocean circulation to um, agriculture cultures all of that so those are um, as I said they don't necessarily have answers for that but these are some of the things that I've heard the, paleo the paleontologists who are really studying this stuff talk about. Oh. Great. Um, and then we have a couple more questions uh, sort of in this forward thinking uh, future situation. So one, um, in terms of our tectonic situation, uh, where, what direction is the continent moving currently? Um, very slowly to the west ish. Uh, we're not moving north or south anymore. Um, with the Pacific Plate off the coast of California or <laughs> part of California, that's moving kind of uh, northwest uh, or, or yeah, northwest. We're kind of moving a little west. So we're sort of crunching a little into it, but sliding with it. So we're not going back north or back south for right now. In another hundred million years, um, it's the most geologists believe that there have been several cycles of continents coming apart and you know moving apart, coming back together, but in different configurations each time. And a lot of geologists think that we are, our continents are about as far apart as they are gonna be. And that in another few million years, they'll start to move back together. And again, it'll be a different configuration than not just out, back, out, back. And so in another, you know, couple hundred million years, who knows what things will look like. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, and then another question uh, about the future. If sea levels rise, could an inland sea return? Ah, that's a great question. Um, Areas will get inundated, but probably not the inland sea. Um, one of the reasons that there was an inland sea back during the late Cretaceous is that, hopefully I can explain this with my hands. Um, so off the coast to the west of us, we had one plate uh, diving down under North America. And as this plate was diving down, it was kind of warping North America down like this. It was kind of dragging this, this interior part down a little bit. And so it 
it sort of dragged it down enough that sea level was able to invade. It was low enough. Um, right now, the interior of North America is too high. Uh, you'd have to really get over some high obstacles, but that doesn't help the coasts <laughs> and all the areas that are low around the coast. Um, but you definitely would have to have some major techno tectonic activity or uh, sea levels would have to go up a lot more than they're pro projected to go up to be able to create another inland sea. But it would be kind of cool. I mean, Arizona and Utah with some coastline, that'd be kind of fun. <laughs> A little day on the beach. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> earlier you mentioned ammonites, um, which I understand to be a quite common fossil. Um, so why are ammonites uh, interesting to paleontologists and and how, you know, wh why are they helpful or for studying paleoclimate? What's interesting about them? Well, um, <laughs> is Alan watching this? No, um, that was my question. Oh, it was? Okay. So <laughs> Alan's an ammonite specialist, so he loves ammonites. So I thought, oh man, he's testing me. Um, <laughs> so ammonites are a really common fossil in a lot of, lot of areas. They're, um, related to octopus and squids today, kind of distantly related to uh, Nautilus. And um, they tell us, they're really, really, really useful for, for telling time, um, especially. I mean, they, they can tell us something about paleoclimate, but what's I think more important for ammonites is that they can tell us about time because ammonites evolve really quickly and they change as they evolve. You get different species or different subspecies and each one looks slightly different, but they, they exist within a really narrow range of time. And so um, rather than having one species of ammonite that goes for 50 million years, you have a bunch of different species. And when you find particular ammonites in a sediment that tells you that those sediments are X years old. And so they're really, really, really useful for basically as a clock, um, as a way to sort of tell, to, to narrow your rock layer down into finer and finer and finer um, time periods. And I think that, uh, I'm sure that Alan, if you did talk to him about ammonites could go on for a very long time. Just have a whole, a whole <laughs> event based on yeah. ammonites. Yeah, <laughs> about ammonites. Um, I think they do help you a little bit with paleoclimate or if not paleoclimate, sort of different uh, depths in the ocean, things mm. like that. They don't, ammonites didn't exist in super, 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 super deep areas, but uh, some may have been a little more near shore, some a little further offshore, things like that, so. Thank you. Um, we have a question about what types of um, protections exist for fossils um, on the monument. That is a great question. Um, so within the monument itself, um, you have to get, you know, permits to be able to collect anything, basically. Um, of plant material, invertebrates or vertebrates, the vertebrate fossils are much more protected um, when you are not in a, a monument or a national park or something like that. There's something called the Paleontological Resources Protection Act, um, PERPA. And uh, basically what it says is that uh, vertebrate fossils have to be um, found on public lands, not private land. Private land, anything goes. But paleo, uh, vertebrate fossils found on public lands have to be excavated by, um, you know, an official institution. They have to go to an official institution. Um, they can't just be picked up by anybody and, and it's very illegal to take them. Um, so with the monument, you have to get a permit and that permit, they're going to ask you, who are you working with? Are you just sort of Joe, anybody who shows up and says, hey, I want to go pick fossils. Um, with lands that are public lands, but not protected under monument status, the protections are greatly decreased. Um, they are allow, you know, they'll allow people to go and pick up invertebrate fossils, 
um, with much less oversight than they would for a monument, um, you know, under monument status. One thing I will mention is that petrified wood is actually not considered a fossil, it is considered a mineral. <laughs> so it has a whole different sort of permit process and it's under a whole different category. And there's definitely um, less protection again in lands that are not uh, protected by monument status for things like petrified wood. And you may or may not know this, but there is a really, really amazing petrified wood deposit um, out near the Circle Cliffs in the uh, eastern part of the monument. Um, it's Triassic in age, so it's a lot older than the stuff I was talking about. It's called the Wolverine Petrified Forest. And some of that area has been taken out of the monument and you know, there's definitely been some issues. So we always wanna see the most protection as possible because <laughs> all fossils, whether they're vertebrates or invertebrates, they're really important and they have something to tell us. And if you, um, you know, if you ever do find a fossil, let's say you're just out hiking and um, even if you're on private land, um, don't take it, take pictures of it, mark it on a map, mark it with your GPS and go find somebody who can tell you, you know, who can help you figure out what it is because as important as the fossil itself is the context. You need the sediments around it. You need the position it's lying in. You need to know what other fossils are around it. Um, that is where you get to, to be able to draw those beautiful paintings that I showed you or you know, paint those beautiful paintings. Those weren't just some artists, you know, sort of, hey, I think I'll just do this. Those were based on really um, accurate information by you know, working with the paleontologist and the only reason they got that information was because the fossils they found, they kept in place, they documented everything. So um, even if you find something on private land, you know, go to a university, go to a museum, go find somebody who can help you figure out what it is because um, that's how we learn. So Yeah, well, that's a good point that the, the context, re context really matters in terms of figuring out what Dory is. It's the same with archaeology, and I would say the same thing. When you find, you know, if you're wandering around out in the desert and you find a bunch of pottery or, um, you know, pieces of chipped stone or something, you know, when people, people create those museum piles, they start putting stuff up on a rock for everyone to see. And the archaeologists see that and they're just like, that, that's, those are useless. Those are completely useless to us because you need the context of um, where, where it was found, what it was doing when it was found and what's with it um, to, to make it uh, scientifically useful. Okay. Uh, we have another question. Um, so the burning coal seams up on Smoky Mountain, are those from the Cretaceous? Yes. Um, excuse me. George. My cat wants to go out. He's crying. Um, he's this enormous cat who has this teeny little voice. And it's very silly. Um, so the coal is from the Cretaceous. Uh, the coal is in what's called the Straight Cliffs Formation. And the Straight Cliffs Formation has four different sort of divisions. And that's what, um, what makes up the Straight Cliffs outside uh, Escalante. So the coal is formed from, um, you know, the Straight Cliffs Formation was laid down on the coastline, these swampy areas as the water's kind of receding a little and all the vegetation that's growing there dies and settles in and gets buried by more sediment and more vegetation ultimately turns into coal. So those coal seams are definitely from the Cretaceous. Um, the burning part of it is not from the Cretaceous. Uh, you can have coal seams burning for hundreds or possibly thousands of years, but probably not uh, 90 million. So <laughs> um, a lot of times those coal seams there are coal seams uh, all over the Southwest and they'll catch fire in a few different ways. Often it's from a lightning strike. It hits the ground and transfers to those coal seams. Sometimes it's, uh, spon well, as far as we know, sort of spontaneous heat from being, you know, buried or something like that. Um, so the, I don't actually know how long those have been burning, but it's a long time because mm -hmm. I've been here 30, Five years and they were burning 35 years ago. So, wow. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so earlier you mentioned um, that this area uh, in terms of fossils shows that during the Lake Cretaceous there was a really high um, amount of biodiversity 
um, compared to what we know about um, other areas, North and South. So can you share a little bit more about, um, it's like what hypotheses exist for why this was such a um, flourishing, diverse uh, environment? Um, yeah, it's, uh, and this kind of goes along also with some of the ideas about why critters didn't go to the north and south. Like there don't seem to have been any huge barriers to, to traveling, you know, up to Canada or down towards Mexico. They could have gone wherever they wanted, but um, it appears that the everything from the nutrients in the ecosystem to the climate, um, to the, the, the sort of geography, what was going on with these rivers flowing off the, the mountains, just combined to create that Goldilocks scenario, you know, that this was just perfect. Why didn't they go anywhere? Well, there've been hypotheses, you know, maybe there was some big geographic barrier that we don't see or et cetera, et cetera. Maybe they just didn't go anywhere because it was perfect. Why do you need to go anywhere else if it's perfect here? And so I think that, you know, most paleontologists seem to think that, you know, this was the perfect place to be. Um, it, the climate was perfect. It wasn't too hot. It wasn't too cold. Not a lot of seasonality. Um, we find they've done these really interesting um, studies where they cut a cross section out of a big, you know, like a leg bone of these big uh, horned dinosaurs. And they compare, they do a thin section and then look at the histology or how the bone grows. Look at it under a microscope, all this stuff. Well, they've compared uh, the dinosaurs from the Kaparowitz region, the Grand Staircase, with the pretty much the same dinosaur um, from the north, like in Alberta, Canada. And what you find, dinosaur bone is a lot like tree rings, um, and other bones do this too. They will, they'll show rings as they grow if there's something that stops them from growing. So maybe it's the cold season when there's less food, or they hibernate, or you know, uh, there's some kind of stressor. Maybe it's a dry season, something like that. Well, what they find is that the bones of the Kaparowitz dinosaurs completely ringless. These guys were just growing all the time. And the bones up in Alberta or further north in Montana, those bones have those uh, rings that show that there were, there, was, there were seasons when things didn't go quite as well. Um, mm -hmm. Doesn't necessarily mean they were starving. It just means that their bones express um, a, a period when there maybe was a little less food or something like that. Um, also, we see turtles massive. I mean, some of these turtles are like three feet long. That is a sign of a warm climate. Um, that is, you don't see turtles that size in Canada, you know, today. Um, so between, you know, it was the perfect latitude. It was the perfect elevation. It was just the perfect sort of ecology for things to be super diverse and uh, for critters to be like, I not want to oh, go anywhere. I don't want to go anywhere. You know, <laughs> this is great. So makes sense. Cool. Um, thank, thank you. Um, and then, uh, kind of related to uh, the ways that bones uh, can tell us a little bit about what's going on, um, perhaps climatically. I was wondering um, if you could share just a little bit more about. Um, since we don't have direct measurements of temperature and other climate indicators from you know, 70 to 90 million years ago. Um, what are uh, any sort of listed some of the tools that we use? Um, how do we infer climate data from those um, proxies? Right. Like, how does that work? Yeah. I mean, obviously, I know it can be different for, for different proxies, but. Right. And, and some of it is um, inference from, okay, one of, one of the, important things that we use, which is not always a, a perfect proxy, but um, is the idea of looking at the modern world and seeing where creatures live today or where plants live today and, and saying, well, it, it doesn't necessarily say that conditions in the past were the same as, as the modern world, but things that happened in the past 
generally, or things that are happening in the modern world a certain way probably happened in the past a certain way. So if you find three foot turtles living in tropical or subtropical climates today, there's no reason to suspect that three foot turtles would be living in a frigid Arctic climate 90 million years ago or you know, 75 million years ago. Um, sand moving in a river today probably moved the same way it, it did um, you know, 75 million years ago. So, so that whole concept of using, we used to call it the principle of uniformitarianism, the present is the key to the past. That's not exactly correct because that implies, a lot of people mistake that to mean that conditions in the present are exactly the same as they were in the past. You know, you know we've had ice ages, uh, we've had hotter, colder, that kind of stuff. But the way things generally work, um, you know, an animal that has super sharp teeth in the present and eats meat and their teeth look like this, their teeth are probably going to look the same in the past as well. So that's one thing we can do is look at the kinds of plants we see. We see palms in the, in the Kaparowitz formation. Well, we don't find palms in Alaska. I mean, you probably do in Anchorage because somebody planted them there, but basically, you know, naturally we find palms in these tropical, subtropical climates. Um, we find these smothering sort of moon seed vines that are a more of a subtropical temperate um, plant. We find, you know, so plants are a really good proxy to give us a sense of what the climate might be like because they can't move. Animals can move. Mm. Um, humans are a terrible proxy. We live everywhere. Um, so another thing that we can use are things like oxygen and carbon isotopes. Um, we can look at uh, things like clams, uh, other invertebrates, snails. They'll make their shells using the water that was available at the time. And depending on what kind of isotope we find in those shells, that can tell us if the water came from uh, glacial you know, a glacial uh, source or um, just a, a rain water source, um, things like that. So those, that's another proxy that we can use is a sort of a chemical proxy. So there's a few, there's a few different proxies like that. And again, none of them are a guarantee because we weren't there. But if, if the, the isotopes, you know, show us something in the present, there's no reason to assume that it wasn't that way in the past also. So those are those so the principles are the same and that helps the principles us. are the same. Exactly. Great. Um, so we have a question about uh, what critters are around today that we can connect back to the Cretaceous? Oh, like they came uh, from the Cretaceous. Almost everything you see <laughs> Had its, uh, had its start in the Cretaceous, especially the late Cretaceous, um, birds, right? Birds are uh, the first birds that we, the first true birds that we see, um, you know, kind of related to modern birds, we start seeing in the late Cretaceous. Yeah, the earliest bird, Archaeopteryx, you know, back in the, the Jurassic, but that thing was um, not really a modern bird. Um, mammals, we see the first, uh, you know, sort of um, more uh, modern mammals um, in the late Cretaceous. Uh, so yeah, pretty much all the, a lot of these modern forms that we have today had their appearance um, in the late Cretaceous or, you know, certainly even a little bit further back than that. But the late Cretaceous is when we first start seeing things. It's like, if you walked around during the late Cretaceous, it's like, huh. <laughs> so familiar. I mean, obviously mammals have changed a lot. <laughs> when when the the non-avian dinosaurs uh, you know became extinct and, and disappeared, the mammals were just like, yes, you know, <laughs> it's ours now. So they kind of went a little crazy, but we see the beginning of it um, mm -hmm. back then in the, the late Cretaceous. So and my understanding is that the monument is a, actually a great resource for mammal fossils as well, even though oh. dinosaurs get all the like uh, yeah. 
they're all flashy, but I've heard that there are some great ma mammalian fossils as well. Absolutely. Um, let's see. I was, I took some notes because, you know, I wrote that book a few years ago and my brain is such that, yeah, I can't remember anything. Um, so I was, I was writing down some notes about there's something in the Wawi, there's something like 33 different species of mammals. And that was when I wrote that, but that was as of 2015. So they probably found even more. Um, there's incredible uh, mammalian fossils in, in the, in the monument, in these late Cretaceous rocks. And, and even more than that, I mean, the lizards, the, the crocodiles, the turtles, um, even things like clams and snails and oysters can tell us stuff. The dinosaurs definitely get all the press. And, you know, it's, it's, it's reasonable. But um, all of these other creatures often tell us more about a landscape than the dinosaurs do. Dinosaurs, it, in some ways are a little more like humans. They could kind of live in a lot of different environments. As long as there were plants and something, you know, and, and other animals to eat, they could live in, in different environments. But these other creatures are a lot more constrained by you know, temperature, by uh, daylight hours, foods, food availability, stuff like that. So um, yes, and in fact, the one of the people who was really a driving force, not the driving force, but one of the driving forces behind the creation of the monument is a mammal specialist. And that's what he was out looking for. He's like, I hate dinosaurs. They're too big. They take forever to die to dig up. So um, he really came out here. He and, and his colleague really came out here looking for mammals. And we've also found, uh, we filled in the straight cliffs formation has filled in this time period, this, this gap in time that is un, almost unknown from the rest of the world. And although we don't have a ton of fossils from the Straight Cliffs Formation, there's a lot of fossils, lizards, mammals, uh, things like that, that tell us, you know, kind of what was going on in the world back then. So. Great, great. Um, well, thanks. This has been really great for, for all of the nerds in our audience. Uh, that includes me <laughs> and the number of our, our audience members. Um, so we really appreciate it. And um, definitely, if you are excited about this, um, folks in the audience, uh, Krista's book is a very good read. It's a great coffee table book. There's some nice pictures, a lot of really good content. So I highly recommend. Um, and I want to I want to end with this question. Um, do you have a favorite um, like species, a favorite find um, from what's been found on the monument? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure that I could say that I have a single favorite. Um, <sighs> I will say one of my favorite things that I found was actually an ammonite. And I think part of the reason that I like those, the invertebrates, things like ammonites, is that you get the whole thing and it looks like what it's supposed to be. And it's, they're beautiful. They're works of art. They're like little sculptures, you know? When mm -hmm. you see these dinosaurs that are, you know, 20 feet long or 40 feet long or whatever, and they're all perfectly recreated, believe me, they did not come out of the ground looking like that. And in fact, if you're wandering across the desert and you find something, you're like, oh, I found a skull. I guarantee you it's not a skull. If it looks like what you think it should be, it's probably not that actual fossil um, because there's so many bones and so many parts to these things. But an ammonite looks like an ammonite. You get the whole thing. <laughs> so I think those are some of my favorite things to find are the mm. little invertebrates because you can just pick them up and go, wow, it's a whole, you know, oyster or clam or, and it looks like what it's supposed to be and you get the whole thing. So. <laughs> Thank you. That's a good answer. I like it. Um, well, once again, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us um, thank this you. evening. And thanks everybody and for, yeah, for, for um, coming and listening and um, yeah, get, get out there and go hiking. And if you find something cool, let the scientists know and uh, never know, you might be part of digging it up or they might name it after you if it's something new. You never know. You never know. All right. Take care, everybody, and uh, we hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.